Thank you, Sistu. Larry, are you there? I am here. Good morning, all of you who are listening from all over the country. Welcome and thank you for being here. My name is Larry Curley. I'm the executive director of the National Indian Council on Aging. And um, this is one of the uh, efforts of us working with you out there in Indian country to provide information that is helpful to you. And I wanna thank you. And I would like to have the opportunity to have uh, Mr. Sixtus Dominguez introduce himself, who he is, where he's from, etc. Mr. Dominguez. Hello everyone, Guida Matereva. My name is Sixto Dominguez and my lines of the tribe are from the southeastern part of New Mexico and West Texas and uh, Mexico Chihuahua area. There's a people there known as Apache people, now known as the Humano Apache people. And that's from my mother's side. From my father's side, I'm Raramuri, which is a tribe in Chihuahua, Mexico, that also has um, uh, relations to the Rio Grande as well. So I'm from the South, I live here in Albuquerque now, and I'm a tribal injury prevention coordinator at the Albuquerque Area Indian Health Board, uh, Southwest Tribal Epidemiology Center. And that's a handful, but 
that's who I am. And I'm very pleased to be here with Nikoa. And I'm just uh, very humbled to be playing some flute for you. And I have some other things uh, in store for you later. Thank you. Matereba. Thank you very much. In Indian country, one of the first things that we do before we start any meeting is to offer a prayer so that our meetings are well received, that people will walk away feeling well about themselves and what's happening around the world. And I have been given the honor of providing this prayer for you. And I will do that in my own native language, which happens to be Navajo. So I'll start now. Dishigo <laughs> Night, Prayer ended. And um, I guess we're going to have uh, somebody uh, share with you uh, the, 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 how the, the plan and the, 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 the day is going to go uh, for the rest of those meetings. Good afternoon, this is Jennifer Gillison. I'm with Kaufman & Associates and I'll help facilitate the meeting for today. Just a couple of technical notes and support. Um, it, when you take a look at your Zoom screen at the bottom, um, there is the mute, the stop video. We ask that you please do go ahead and, and share your webcam so that everyone can see you. Um, we'll have a couple of exercises later on that will be beneficial. And then there's also the chat function. A lot of you have already found that. Um, you can chat individually or you can chat with everyone. If you can let us know who you are and which tribe you're from, that would be great. Also, if you have any technical assistance issues, you can type it in there and one of us will um, go through and assist you. If you lose connectivity, you can rejoin this session just by uh, clicking on the link in the email confirmation that you had received. I will now go ahead and turn it over to Lisa. Good morning, everybody. Um, so today I'm giving away two raffles for Walmart and you have to be present to win. And on my first, my first person on my list um, who is actually present is going to be Valerie Bryant. And then on the box, the chat, you can just say here. And the next one I saw, let's see, is going to be Thomas Gardner. Congratulations to both of you. Um, Lisa will go through and get in touch with you so that you can get the gift cards. Now we will turn it over to Becky. Hi, everyone. Um, such a blessing to have so many people with us today. We're, we're so happy to have you with us. And I am the um, an Eastern Band Cherokee from Cherokee, North Carolina. And I'm excited and honored to welcome Sherry Solway Black as our first guest. Her um, her biography is quite extensive. She's worked for more than 40 years with American Indian issues in the American Indian Policy Review Commission, the Indian Health Service, First Nations Development Institute, the National Congress of American Indians, and as a private consultant. 
She currently serves on the boards of directors of the Johnson Scholarship Foundation, the First People's Fund, Prosperity Now, and as a trustee for the newly formed Native American Agriculture Fund. She also serves on the board of trustees for the National Indian Child Welfare Association. And in 2011, Barack Obama appointed her to the President's Advisory Committee on Financial Capability. She has a Master's of Business Administration degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a Bachelor's degree from East Stroudsburg University, where in 2013, she received the Distinguished Alumni Award. In 2016, Ms. Black received a Special Distinguished Leadership Award from the National Congress of American Indians, and in 2019 received the John W. Gardner Leadership Award from the independent sector. She is Oglala Lakota and is originally from South Dakota. She and her husband, Ron Black, a citizen of the Seneca Nation, live in Falmouth, Virginia. So welcome, Sherry. <laughs> Of course, I forget to unmute myself, but <laughs> thank We're you, Becky. Learning. I know, I know. <laughs> we, we've all done so many of these, but uh, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to be here today. It really is an honor for me to, uh, to be with NICOA, to be um, an elder, um, a senior citizen, to have uh, um, spent more than 40 five years actually working in native communities on development. So I'm, again, it's really an honor. It's an honor to see everyone here on the, on the uh, Zoom meeting. Excellent. Well, let's go ahead and we're, what we're wanting to talk about is some of the work that you've been doing in your career. And so the first thing we'd like to ask is how did you get involved in doing asset development work to help build native economies in Indian country? Um, Long story, I'll try to shorten it, but part of it is, as we all know, probably everyone here on the call is affected by policies in Indian country. And I was born on Pine Ridge, I'm a Gual Lakota, but I didn't grow up there. My mother was um, from Pennsylvania, met my dad as a nurse on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and they moved back and forth um, in the 50s. This was with relocation. Um, and efforts around um, a lot of Indian country around termination. My dad had been in World War II, he was a veteran. And so they moved back and forth and finally settled in Pennsylvania where I grew up. And when I graduated from college, I wanted nothing more to do than to go back to South Dakota. Um, and that was in 1974. Um, and so if folks remember what was happening in 1974. It was a lot of activism. The takeover of Wounded Knee was the year before. So it really was a wake up call for me as to what was happening in Indian country. And, and again, you know, we're all affected by these events that happen during our lives. And uh, so that really led me to um, hook up with a cousin and come to Washington DC in 76 for the Amer to work for the American Indian Policy Review Commission. And that was the very last congressional commission that studied native issues. And um, again, around a lot of activists from that time and really learning about um, kind of taking control of our own lives. Self-determination came in 1975, the act, uh, the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act. My background was in health education. So I um, got a job, I went to the Indian Health Service and uh, started there and they provided the support for my master's degree. And, you know, when you get that kind of support in your life, you have to pay it back. And mm -hmm. And that's really what I was doing with, with my career is to, um, to want to work in native communities. And I worked for the Indian Health Service. And again, folks, this was in the um, you know, early 1980s where there hadn't yet been a transition to native people in management. Um, I was one of, the, one of the early folks at headquarters, but also the federal government was really still dominating native communities. Um, I was there working when Rosebud um, was the very first uh, tribe to take over the planning of their hospital under a 638 contract. And so I was so much wanting to say yes to Native communities. Yes, you can do this. You know, if you want to do this, you can do it. So I left the Indian Health Service and went to work for First Nations Development Institute in 1985. And that's what we did. We said yes to Native communities. 
where they had an idea what they wanted to do. And we did everything we could to try to help them do that. And so that was, I worked there for 20 years. And that's when um, this graphic that um, you'll see um, at some point um, really talks about um, the focus of our work um, through assets in Indian country. And um, many of you know, the Indian controlled school movement started in the you know, the 60s and the, went through the 70s and 80s where, you know, you had tribal colleges, the first one in 1968 or 69. Um, you had schools on Navajo that were Indian controlled. So we were really starting to gain control of our institutions and, and those are our assets. So that's sort of really what focused me on um, looking at control. Um, so, so that was the first instance. So that was a long answer to your question. You lived so. through some tumultuous events. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that slide you mentioned, if, if we could share that, um, tell us about this slide and about the elements of development. Sure, well, this came out of the first decade of work at First Nations. And again, um, there's an article that um, Becky will provide the link to that goes with this. It was done in 1994, so it's um, somewhat out of date, but still very relevant, I think. Well, this was drawn from the work that Native communities were telling us, in essence, that assets, and assets are things that we value. A lot of folks will say, um, oh, there's no native word for assets or, you know, looking at it in a, strictly a financial way of, of looking at it, but we shouldn't um, because it is things like our institutions. It's our children's education. Um, so assets are things that we value. If you look at it in the financial sense, the economic sense, it is something that provides income. So assets provide income, um, like a business um, provides income you know, a, a house grows in value. So, so people tend to think of those as assets, but it's also our culture. Um, it's our culture bearers. And that's why it's tied, these quadrants are important to kinship in essence, that it really our um, ownership of assets and control of them is so important, whether it be, um, you know, our schools, our tribal governments, you know, you began to see tribes taking over um, control management um, of their governments in the 70s into the 80s, 90s, and, and so on. And, you know, again, I could probably spend a couple hours going through, through the chart here, but just to, to recognize how um, important um, assets are. So there were, there was a lot of work done in the early 1990s around um, rather than just look at income for people, like trying to increase our income, but it's also to look at um, uh, assets, creating new assets like businesses, um, you know, getting our land back, um, having a house, getting an education, all of those kinds of things are what we looked at as control of assets. I can see there is a lot to look at and understand here. So this is just <laughs> to scratch the surface of all this. Um, if, do you have any other comments about that or do you want to move on or? Well, I think in the sense of if we talk about, um, I know we were looking at kind of cutting back on some of the questions here, but how that gets us into the racial, the wealth gap, if you wanted to follow up with that. Oh, sure, sure. Yes, uh, help us understand. I first met you at a conference that's now called Prosperity Now, um, but back then it was called CFED and was so impressed with the energy and diversity of that organization. And that's where the first time I heard the term racial wealth gap and it'd be uh, great to have your definition of that. And why do you think it's important for Indian people to understand it? Right, so um, again, Prosperity Now, or I serve on the board, um, you know, has an a biannual conference called the, the um, Prosperity Now Summit that they just had a few weeks ago. And they really focus on this racial wealth gap. Again, um, income only gets us so far. And, and we look at wealth, you know, the accumulation of assets and that assets that grow in value, um, like your house, um, again, like an education or a business, or if you have investments like a retirement plan, 
Um, and what they have found is that there is a widening, um, it's not getting any better, gap between um, white population in the United States and uh, people of color. Unfortunately, they don't have great data on native wealth and that wealth gap, but they do for um, uh, black and, and uh, Latino uh, communities, they do, and they're showing this wealth gap to be um, significant, meaning um, I think the latest figures, uh, and you can go to the Prosperity Now website, show that the average um, wealth accumulation in a white um, family is 117 uh, thousand, but it's only like in the 50s and 60s for families of color. And the reason there's not, I think, good data on native communities is the issue of um, the status of much of our land, of our housing, those types of things. So it's very difficult sometimes to put a value on that. So it's difficult. So there are, there are some researchers now that are beginning to look at wealth in native communities. Um, if we go back to, uh, um, you know, talking about it from a tribal perspective, you can look at the development of assets over time in tribal communities, um, the casinos, the hotels, the, whatever your tribe is doing, um, those are producing income, you know, they're um, for the tribe to support other kinds of things. And so those are assets. So again, because of the structure of native communities and economy, sometimes it's difficult. We have to develop our own definitions and understanding of those of the wealth in native communities. Okay. Um, given that information, um, the what role do you think that the native community development financial institutions, our native CDFIs play in asset development? Right, well, if folks aren't aware, there is such a thing as um, CDFIs, Community Development Financial Institutions, and they were started by uh, an act of uh, Congress in 1994. Um, and this is housed out of the Treasury Department. And probably in total in the whole, con and these are, um, they're not necessarily unregulated um, financial institutions, but they're able to do community development. They're not um, typically, the, um, um, you know, as like banks, uh, that type of thing. They're able to do the kind of lending for housing, for small business development, for land purchases that in communities of color, we have not had the kind of banking relationships that we should have were unbanked or were underbanked. And so native CDFI, well CDFIs period, were to help poor and underserved communities be able to have access to credit and capital. And so um, starting in the 2000s, the treasury program really helped to support native ones. We started working on one in 1985, which became the Lakota funds, which was the first one in um, in South Dakota, but now there are more than 70 certified native CDFIs and they provide um, support primarily for small business development, but there also are ones that are housing um, to help people purchase housing, to help people start businesses, to help people purchase land. And again, those are helping us to um, to save, um, you know, some of them are helping us to save, and those are all the assets that are helping us to build our wealth. So these native financial institutions are critical. They're critical infrastructure for capital. Unfortunately, they're not on every reservation. They're not in every community, um, but they are, you know, again, more than 70. Um, and there's probably a, a little over a thousand total in the country. So we have a big portion of them considering our population that we have 70. And there are some in the pipeline that are still developing too. They seem like a very feisty group too. I, I, yeah. I listen in on their Friday calls and they're, oh. they're, they're busy. Right. So there's, a, there's an entity called the Native CDFI Network, NCN, and they do have Friday calls if you want to check in on that too. Uh, we're doing great on time. Um, okay. Tell us about some of the exciting work you've been involved in since you've retired. As you seem <laughs> as busy, if not busier, since you've retired. For example, the Johnson Scholarship Foundation, the Native American Agri Agricultural Fund, Prosperity Now, and the First Peoples Fund. 
Great. Well, Johnson Scholarship Foundation, I first became aware of them in the mid 1990s, and they are a private foundation, um, private family foundation started by a man and his wife, who was one of the original employees of UPS, Ted Johnson Sr. and his wife, um, Vivian, and they um, bought UPS stock. So when it went public, um, they had quite a bit of money. And um, Ted Johnson, in addition to two other focus areas, which are disadvantaged and disability, just really felt that American Indian people had gotten a raw deal, he said. So he really wanted to support education because education can help people. So we now fund, um, for the past 20 plus years, Johnson has funded scholarships for Native American students studying business. Um, and we do that through a variety of different strategies with tribal colleges and universities. There are programs with native serving institutions. We started the, uh, the MBA in American Indian Entrepreneurship at Gonzaga University of which have had 20, oh, I'm sorry, 70 native students get their MBA through that program over the last uh, 10 to 12 years. Um, we just are setting up now a scholarship program at the American Indian Graduate Center for native students in finance and accounting, undergraduate and graduate. We have a few endowments set up with the American Indian College Fund. So again, this focus on business and entrepreneurship in Indian country. So it's been very exciting to work with them. And the um, First Peoples Fund, that's uh, the other one, I chair the board there. And if folks aren't aware, it's, a, it's an organization, again, 25 years old. Lori Puyer is the um, uh, CEO and president. And they focus working with native artists and culture bearers throughout the country. And they have a number of different programs, grant programs for artists and business leadership, artist entrepreneurs. They have awards program, the Community Spirit Award, which is an annual award for native uh, that are nominated from their communities, culture bearers who continue the culture. Um, so they really look at this creative economy and what's happening. And we all know how, what a high percentage of artistic um, people and culture bearers there are in Native communities, so the focus is on, on them. And Prosperity Now, as Becky has, has talked about, that's a national organization focused on looking at, um, again, some asset building strategies, but looking at this racial wealth divide and how can we make things more equitable um, in that through policy um, kinds of changes. And then um, the Native American Agriculture Fund, and many of you might be aware of the Keep Siegel lawsuit, which was settled in during the Obama administration. It was a, a lawsuit by Native farmers and ranchers who um, proved that there was discrimination um, in credit programs through the USDA. And the lawsuit um, was settled. And after the claims were paid out, there was a remainder amount. And that was set up to be a private foundation of the Native American Agriculture Fund. And we were, there were trustees who were appointed by the court um, in the settlement. And I was one of those. Um, so I serve, I have, we have all have different terms um, in that. But we've since made $27 million um, in grants for native food related um, farmers and ranchers to support native farmers and ranchers and fishers. And again, sort of a broad, this broad definition. And we really launched in 2018. So it's a little over two years and we've done funding um, of 27 million. And we have a limited lifespan um, 20 years um, and, and then it goes out of, uh, uh, so we have to finish the work in, in 20 years. So, mm -hmm. so that's it in a nutshell, it keeps me busy. Wow, okay. <laughs> so everybody should make a, a note of those uh, different organizations so they can uh, check out if there's anything they qualify for. Mm -hmm. um, how can our organization, National Indian Council on Aging and others, and the members play a part in building wealth in Indian country in the way that you mean, that broad sense that you mean? Wow, so there are, um, uh, there's so many, again, that's sort of a whole different session <laughs> that we could have. I would love to, to have that. I think, um, and again, to make it a little personal in this, I, Think about my, my mom and my dad and the kinds of lessons they gave me in, um, you know, we, were, we 
were poor growing up as, as many, many of us are in the sense of budgeting and financial management and um, being a role model, I think for kids and grandkids in terms of um, being financially um, aware of what's happening and um, how to look at, at securing you know, a, a, a future. Um, and uh, I, I think in the sense of, there, there are some great studies out there. If you wanna read more um, about it, I put together a list of resources, which I'll send to Becky. Um, for example, um, for, with First Nations, there are a great many studies there about financial capability, about so much of the, the work that they've done over the past 30 years. Um, and then um, so a lot of work being done recently on um, uh, sort of looking at the narrative out there and looking at it changing the, narr the narrative um, about getting people to learn about and understand what's happening in native communities. And that's part of it is to say, hey, you know, we are still here, the land is still here, and, you know, we are um, a people kind of doing things. And if you're not familiar with it, it's an organization called Illuminative. Um, and they just came out with a study um, very, very recently, like within the last month, that focuses on, um, they did a survey of 6,000 Native people, and it's really looking at Indigenous futures. And it talks about the recent election and who votes, and obviously, um, senior citizens vote at a higher rate, you know, as others. And I, you know, so I think there are so many different things, available resources to educate ourselves about some of the things that are happening out there um, in Indian country. Thanks, Sherry. Are we yeah. good on time? Oh yeah, I think so. Um, there's, there's so much of an, I, I think the things you're saying are so fascinating that we would really like to try and ask you back again, if we possibly can, maybe in the new year, we'll try to set something up so we can get into and dig into some of these topics more. Um, I'd love, love to do that. That would be great. Jennifer, do you know if we have any questions from the listeners? We don't, but if you do have any questions, you can enter them into the chat box and we would be happy to pose them to um, Sherry. I think everybody wants to get on with the exercises. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, dealing with these issues and thinking about these topics is a form of ce celebration, at least to me. So I mm -hmm. think, oh, here's a here is a question. I'm gonna go ahead, Jennifer, if it's okay. It says, how can how do we come become more involved? Well, I think again, I would look to um, your location, in essence, your community, as to. Um, what is available in that area. Um, and also too, I think so many folks are, um, there is, do you have to live on the, on the reservation to apply for the agricultural fund? Well, it has to be an organization, um, no grants to individuals, um, but it, or a tribe. So there are four different um, groups that we can provide funds to, um, nonprofit, educational institution, tribal government, or native CDFI. And, and looking at the support for native farmers and ranchers and food, food system kinds of things. Um, but going back to the other one, I think a lot of folks are really connecting back with their, with their tribes. And I know some tribes, you know, open, hold open, if, if you live in the city and, you know, don't live on your home reservation, I know there's ways to connect back to that. Also, um, you know, different native, um, um, nonprofit organizations, I think you can connect with uh, with those as well. And there's a growing number of those. Um, let's see. Um, Darcy says, Quinana, for your service to Indian Country Elder Black, I'm re-strategizing our nonprofit into bridging homelessness to home ownership. Do you have any advice? Um, again, I would... Um, it's been a couple of years before I really was um, informed about what was happening specifically in the native housing area. But I would encourage, if, if you know um, Native American Indian Housing Council to go to that site 
And then um, I don't know which, you know, out of the 70 plus native CDFIs, my guess would be maybe 10% of them are focused on housing and to really look at some of the unique things that they are doing as well. Um, I know there's one on Pine Ridge. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna have a memory lapse here on, on names <laughs> and stuff, but, uh, but yeah, so I think through, through, um, through that work too. All right, let's see. Um, how, how are things in your area with the pandemic, Valerie asks. Valerie asked, yeah. So um, I'm, I live with, my husband and I live in Virginia and um, our rates are going up not as quickly as other places, but I, um, you know, I, I was on calls yesterday and whatever with, with friends and colleagues who work in South Dakota um, and we all know, you know, the stories of what's happening in, in uh, on Navajo and Hopi and those areas. So really in North Dakota, I was on a call with some folks there from the, from the Agricultural Council that it's really, really taking a toll, um, you know, on, on native folks um, there. And, you know, again, it really is. Um, this organization I mentioned, Illuminative, um, has a, um, part of their, they did a, a COVID-19 survey in Indian country as part of that. And that's also on their website. If you wanted to look like what is happening um, with uh, COVID-19 in Indian country. And again, these are fairly recent documents. And also um, I was on First Nations website too. They also have a report on it as well. Okay. Um... Darcy says, what are some specific ways CDFIs can help procure homes for so many of our homeless native relations? Again, I don't know specifics of the kind of programming they do, but they will work with people um, as CDFIs do generally on um, uh, if somebody has really awful credit or a bad history, you know, financial history, uh, I would imagine even if they are homeless too. They work on um, building your, repairing, they call it your credit um, history. Um, so that's, I know one aspect of it. I don't know one specifically that are working um, on veterans, but there are ones that I've heard of in the past. I can't mention them right off hand, that do work with uh, veterans programs on the reservation too with housing. Some work on home ownership, some work on being able to help people get deposits for rental. Um, so it's not just owning a home, it's actually having a home, having a place to, to live too that they, that they work with, so. Very good. Okay, now we are getting a little tight on time. Okay. But I, I, let's try and go through these quickly. Nicolette is asking, does the Ag Fund apply for co-ops that families start? What are the concepts? Example is today's agriculture is taking from the land and I've learned that we need better soil, soil recuperating. I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. So it um, the, the four structures that we can fund are... Um, Nonprofits, 501c3 organizations. So if a co-op is structured as a 501c3 organization, then yes, um, it could apply for, for funding. Um, and educational institutions um, and native CDFIs and then tribal governments. Um, so, um, so that category 501c3 nonprofits is very, very broad. Native controlled, um, you know, we, we um, focus on those areas as well, so. All right. So people can go to the websites and learn more, I'm sure, about those different. Right, Native Agriculture, um, Native American Agriculture Fund, NAF, um, to, okay. to go to that website for sure. And then Mary Jo Hunter, who is also an ICOA board member, is asking or making a comment. President-elect Biden has a plan for Native Americans. Have you seen any benefits for our community in his plan? Um, I have not seen it yet. I've known a couple of people who were working on it, who I've worked with over time. So, um, you know, again, having him having been in the Obama administration, which there was quite a bit of focus on um, tribes and native communities. In fact, if you look at all of the 
um, claim settlements that were done under Obama, I would assume, I would, I, I shouldn't say that, I should look at the plan and comment on it, and I haven't seen it, but just because of that history um, in common. And if you look now, I mean, um, boy, what did I just read? Three more, or three Native women now in Congress, I think it's three or four, um, that were just elected in this past. I think New Mexico has, uh, has one, Deb, Holland. Um, mm -hmm. So I think there are there are three in total now um, that are that are in Congress. So well, I think, so I so I think in terms of a new administration and and a new Congress, you know, we can look to to those folks as well. Sherry, it's just scratching the surface <laughs> of all the things that we'd love to talk about with you. And uh, thank you so much for all your wisdom and the work you've done over your career. And I hope we can do this again very soon. Right. So thank you very much. Well, I'm going to stay on for a little bit and benefit from the rest of the stuff. So I might have to leave at some point, but I'll, I'll be on for a bit. It's thank been my honor. Thank you so much. Thank you. And now um, I believe the next up is going to be Sue Chapman. So you're on mute. Sorry about that. I'll get that someday. So thank you, Becky. And thank you, Sherry, very much uh, for all that wonderful information. Um, that's a hard act to follow, I'll tell you that. Um, so what better to talk about next uh, after talking about financing than healthy ways to manage stress? Um, you know, we all have financial uh, stress in our lives. so. Um, next slide, please. So what I'm going to talk about briefly is what causes stress, what stress does to our bodies, ways to reduce stress. Next slide, please. This is just a comic. Um, this is kind of how I feel some days, trying to excel in my career, maintain a social life, drink enough water, exercise, text everyone back, or email everyone back, stay sane, survive, and be happy. So this is how I, I feel uh, um, sometimes when I am uh, very stressed. So um, next slide, please. So we have um, on top of our, our regular life stress, um, uh, finance, family, other illnesses, and abuses of some, of some kind, we also have on top of that, the 2020 COVID pandemic. Um, a lot of stress around, um, am I around somebody that's, that's got it? Am I gonna get it? Worry about my family, are they gonna get it? Um, not knowing the truth, um, that's a big one because it's kind of like you're in limbo and you, know, you hear so many different stories, you just don't know what to believe and that's extremely stressful. And then also what's next? Uh, immunizations, medications, you know, those kinds of things to help us through the pandemic. Next slide, please. So the, we, we know most of these, but I'm gonna go through it real quick. So the, the common effects of stress on your body, headache, um, muscle pain, tension, chest pain, which you should have looked at if you have extreme chest pain, fatigue, change in sex drive, stomach upset, sleep problems. I know when I'm under a lot of stress, I have a really hard time sleeping, waking up in the middle of the night with my mind going 100 miles an hour. On your mood, um, anxiety, restlessness, lack of motivation or focus, feeling overwhelmed, irritability or anger, sadness or depression. And then when you're feeling that way, you have behaviors overeating, undereating, angry outburst, drug or alcohol misuse, tobacco use, social withdrawal, and exercising less often. Next slide, please. So um, when it gets really bad, just know that there are people you can call out there. Talk to somebody. Talk to your doctor, 
talk to, um, if it gets too bad, talk to a family member, you know, reach out. There's, I wanted to just list these. Um, I, this slide, I don't know if the, how, how this um, slide will be um, distributed, but just, I just listed this so that you know that there are a lot of hotlines out there prepared to help um, with, with stress and if you feel overwhelmed, okay? So make sure that you're reaching out to somebody. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, there are things you can do to manage stress. And we've, again, we've heard a lot of these, but getting regular physical activity. Right now it can be difficult because we're not getting out a whole lot, but get out and just go for a walk around your neighborhood. Go for a walk around your house. Um, get out in your back porch and, and do some, some movement or, or just breathe um, the fresh air uh, if you can. Um, practicing re relaxation techniques, such as deep breathing, meditation, yoga, Tai Chi, or massage. We have learned uh, here at NICOA, we have a staff member who is a Tai Chi master, and at our national conference, she will do um, sessions on Tai Chi, and they are always packed to the max. Um, it is very easy to do, either standing or sitting, and um, it, it helps a lot with balance, which is another stressor, the fear of falling. So set aside for time for family, friends, as you know, as much as you can be around them, play games, um, talk, um, just spend time with your family and friends. Setting aside time for hobbies, such as reading a book or listening to music, just find something you enjoy doing, knitting, crocheting, art, painting, and then keeping a sense of humor. Next slide, please. I want to talk a little bit about laughter because we use humor a lot to um, distract from, uh, to diffuse situations, um, to help us get through things. And so, the, but there's a lot of benefits to laughter. This is one of the, the, the easiest ways to try to um, diffuse stress in your life. The benefits of laughter and humor is there are many physical health benefits. It boosts immunity, which is really important right now. Lowers stress hormones, decreases pain, relaxes your muscles, prevents heart disease, believe it or not. Mental health benefits, it adds joy and zest to life. It eases anxiety and tension, relieves stress, improves your mood, and strengthens resilience. And there's social benefits as well. Um, it strengthens relationships when you can laugh together. It attracts others to us. It enhances teamwork. It, it helps diffuse conflict. Um, and it promotes group bonding. Next slide, please. So how to bring more laughter into your life? You know, laughter is a birthright. It really is a natural part of life that is innate and inborn. Um, if you think about a baby, they often begin smiling during the first weeks of life and usually laugh out loud within months of being born. That's really something. Even if you did not grow up in a household where laughter was common sound, you can learn to laugh at any stage of life. <clears throat> What I'd like you to think about doing is um, to begin by setting aside special times to seek out humor and laughter as you might with exercising but, and build from there. Eventually you wanna incorporate humor and laughter into the fabric of your life, finding it naturally in everything. So here are some ways to start. Smile. Smiling is a beginning of laughter and like laughter, it's contagious. When you look at someone or see something even mildly pleasing, practice smiling. Even sitting here today, if you just smile, it makes, it just does something to your mood. If everybody wants to take a second to smile, it, it just makes you feel good and it's a start. Count your blessings, literally make a list. 
Um, the simple act of considering the positive aspects of your life will distance you from negative thoughts and block humor and that block humor and laughter. When you hear laughter, move towards it. Sometimes humor and laughter are private, a shared joke among a small group, but usually not. More often, people are very happy to share something funny because it gives them an opportunity to laugh again and feed off the humor you find in it. Spend time with fun, playful people. Now, sometimes this is not really easy to do, but try to find those people in your life. Bring humor into conversations. Just ask people, what's the funniest thing that happened to you today, this week in your life? Um, next slide, please. You can also create opportunities to laugh by watching a funny movie, a YouTube video, invite friends or coworkers to a comedy club. Not now, don't do it now. I don't think they're even open, but um, read the funny pages, seek out funny people, share a good joke or funny story. I often, I send out um, to participants in the program that I, that I direct, I send out um, newsletters or um, just helpful sheets um, in their paychecks. And I often put jokes at the bottom of the page just to give somebody an opportunity to laugh because I like to laugh and it makes me feel good. So um, seek out funny people, share a good joke, and check out your bookstore's humor section. Um, which you can always find online today, easy to find online. Host a game night with your family at this time. Uh, play with a pet. Just having a pet on your lap and, and petting the pet re relieves stress. Um, go to a laughter yoga class. I've never heard of this, but um, that would be fun to do. I couldn't breathe, but um, goof around with children, um, with your grandchildren, nieces, nephews, do something silly, make time for fun activities. How about karaoke? <laughs> that could be stressful too. Next slide, please. Oh, oh, no, next, not next slide yet. Um, so like I said earlier, oftentimes we use humor, humor to diffuse a situation or during difficult times to make light of the situation. I'd like to take this moment to show you a short video to lighten your day a little bit and bring a smile to your face. Please forgive me, however, for one word, one word that you may find offensive. It really was very hard to find a clean comedian. <laughs> I hope you get a little giggle out of this. Next, next slide, please. And you can play the video. And I watch different types of laughter. And the ones that have the most explosive laugh, the ones that are really a powerful laugh, the black people. You watch the black comedians, the black concerts, the Chris Rocks, and you watch the black audience, when they laugh, they're like this, say, Wah! And they start kicking and running around. You're like, settle down. It was just a knock-knock joke, you know? But they really, like, they really give her a, they overdo it lots. <laughs> and way over here, way over here on this side of the scale, the ones that have the most conservative laugh, the ones that really hold back their laugh, uh, white people. You see white people laugh, like I say. And they always fold up, huh? <laughs> they look constipated. <laughs> I gotta take a shit. <laughs> the best laugh I've seen, probably because I'm native, native people, huh? we laugh, eh? oh. It's a beautiful thing, oh. Our elders laugh, it's beautiful, huh? <laughs> Our shy ones, yeah, shy ones. <laughs> Q 
Cross Lakers? Ah! <laughs> yeah, I got wet chins. Huh? Ah! Even our, even the big Indians, the big natives, huh? They laugh and they just they, they just bounce and they, all the air, huh? <laughs> Start sweating. <laughs> And powerful. The best laughter I've seen, and I travel across North America, Native woman. Ooh. You all laugh the same. No matter what tribe you are, Jibwe, Cree, OG, Cree, Sioux, don't matter. May T, Bill C, 31, don't matter. You all laugh the same. There's five moves you make. <laughs> I've seen you. The first move a native woman makes when she laughs, her head goes back and makes a sound. <laughs> that sound. <laughs> if she's got no neck or shoulder. <laughs> move number two. They will give you one clap. <laughs> I seen you. <laughs> Move number three. They'll lean forward or sideways. The person beside him push over you. <laughs> Move number four. They'll either hit him or grab him. <laughs> they laugh hard. <laughs> They punch them. <laughs> the white folks are going, look at those Indians, they're fighting again. They're fighting. <laughs> and move number five, they'll point. <laughs> That's you! <laughs> That's a powerful laugh, man. Am I right, eh? Am I right? Yes. <laughs> Those are my uh, red skin spice girls there. <laughs> Making all that racket. Spam spice. Bologna spice. The oldest one is Old Spice. So, with that, uh, that made me feel, it makes me feel good to be able to laugh. So, in, in closing, I just want to say um, how to develop your sense of humor. First of all, laugh at yourself. Share an embarrassing moment. The best way to take yourself less seriously is to talk about times when you took yourself too seriously. Attempt to laugh at situations rather than bemoan them. If you didn't laugh, you know those situations where if you didn't laugh, you'd cry? We say that often. Surround yourself with reminders to lighten up and remember funny things that happen. Don't dwell on the negative. Find your inner child and deal with stress. So in closing, next slide, please. I just want to wish everybody a beautiful day and hoping for a stress-free day for all. Thank you very much. Now we are going to move on to a five minute break with um, some wonderful music again from Cistus and then come right back from your break because Lisa will be here again for another drawing. So thank you very much, everybody.
I'm going to try to play this flute without laughing, but it's going to be hard after seeing Don Birdstick. So if I laugh during the flute, you understand why? So I'm thinking one of those jokes. So this goes out to all the Native veterans, the elders, and all the tribal leaders who are present. And if they're not present, we're sending them out to uh, you anyways. And uh, all the re relatives from the little babies uh, to the elders, this is, this is for you.
Hi, Sisters. Thank you very much. That was beautiful as always. You're welcome. Lisa, do you want to go ahead? Yes, I was just going to start. Hello, everybody. Um, once again, it's time to give away um, gift cards. And the two names I'm calling out is Leslie Washuta and Florence Petrie. And then in the um, chat box, just say that you're here and they'll get right back to you. And that's it. And then the next one will be towards the end of the, um, the meeting, the session. Okay, next up is um, presenting is Sexis Dominguez for um, Let's Exercise Together and Have Fun. Mm -hmm. It's me again. <laughs> so thank you again for having me, Naiko. It's an honor and a pleasure again to be here with you. As I mentioned earlier, I am with uh, Aztec at Albuquerque Area Southwest Tribal Epidemiology Center. And, um, you know, I want to dedicate these exercises to all the COVID, uh, the indigenous COVID uh, people who are no longer with us due to this pandemic. And I just want to start with that intention and to acknowledge that uh, I thank you so much for the presenters who've gone before me. And a lot of things stuck out to me so far, but one of the things that I was listening to with, with Ms. Black was the idea of wealth. And so, you know, as indigenous people, um, health is wealth. One of the wealths that we do have is our health and our connection to that wealth and the land. And so I sit here in um, downtown Albuquerque, south of downtown in a, in a building that's made of earth and it is a home. And so one of the things that I've been trying to do along with my family and the tribal knowledge that I hold is to try to develop those assets. And one of the things is to understand that our homes really affect our health. And so we've been able to, with the help of our families, um, to build this home out of earth in a traditional way. It's a contemporary uh, tradition now because it is has electricity and things but it is mostly made of earth and so the uh, our home is also part of our earth and our earth uh, tells us that we should think of our bodies also as a home and so I just wanted to bring that out and I want to if you can please share your webcam I'm going to go through some exercises so turn on your webcam if you have access to a camera please turn that on now and I'm going to ask you uh, to, if you'd like to follow along with these exercises, they're going to be really uh, gentle. But of course, you always need to check with your physician first to make sure it's okay for you to exercise. If you have any questions of that, maybe you can watch and then pick these up at another time. Uh, but these are going to be very safe exercises. And I appreciate the mentioning of, uh, that Sue Chapman mentioned of Tai Chi. I'm also a Tai Chi instructor. I also teach a matter of balance, which is another fall prevention course. And I work uh, providing these resources to the 27 area tribes in the Albuquerque uh, IHS area. And I am funded, I'm just finishing up a grant with the IHS. Uh, it's a tribal um, injury prevention cooperative agreement. Uh, it was a five year grant. Part of that objectives in that grant is to provide elder fall prevention resources to our communities. I uh, just want to make sure uh, you know where I'm coming from. So it's an honor to be here. So I'm going to start with some warm-up exercises. So if you have a nice sturdy chair, get comfortable. Just kind of sit back, but open your legs a little bit and put your feet straight on the ground. And so uh, a lot of some of these actually are also can be incorporated into Tai Chi warm-up. In Tai Chi, we always start with warm-ups. Uh, in other uh, fall prevention courses, actually, anytime you exercise, it's, it's really good to stretch or to do some warm up exercises. And it's also good and recommended to do some cool down exercises. So uh, if you can do that, it's going to help you uh, prevent injury. And that's really what I'm, I'm all about in uh, injury prevention. So we're going to start from the top of our body and we're going to go down with some exercises. And so uh, <clears throat> I want you just to take your arms to the side and just wiggle them a little bit. 
And as we do that, start to, start to uh, think about your breath a little bit. So we are in this pandemic right now. And one of the main, um, one component of this pandemic is that uh, it affects our breath. This, this disease actually goes and, and starts in our, and can start in our nose or our mouth, but it, it, it can uh, affect our breathing and it attacks the respiratory system. So one thing that you could do to prevent COVID is to actually practice deep breathing. If you can do that once a day, twice a day, or three times a day, that's great. Just start anytime you can. Just be mindful of it. And so I want you to put your hands uh, at your belly. And we're going to start with some uh, deep breathing. And so there's a couple of different ways to breathe. Well, there's several ways to breathe. The one I'm, I'm going to show you is, is to focus on your nose. So you, when you breathe in and your hands are on your belly, you're breathing in and you actually think about expanding your, your, your belly like a balloon on the in breath. So you breathe in and on the breath out, you kind of, you can feel, or you can even lightly, gently touch or push with your hands in. So breathing in, you expand the balloon. Breathing out, you push that balloon out. So breathing in, you expand the balloon. And just, let's do a couple of these on your own pace. We're just gonna, let's just do five. So in. As you're doing this, just think about your breath. And you can focus more on this at home. When you breathe in, you can think about expanding your belly. This is a deep breathing technique. As you breathe out, you try to push that in as if you're going to kiss the back of your spine with your, with your belly. You're trying to touch that. That's just an example of kind of a mental idea. So that's one way for doing deep breathing. You can do those three or four or five times a day. A good time to do it is in the morning when you're at the edge of your bed. You can just sit there and just take some breaths until you finally just understand, you hear your own breath. And then after you've kind of relaxed, then begin the exercise of deep breathing again. When you breathe in, you're, you're trying to blow that balloon. And when you breathe out, you're trying to take that breath out. And you can gently, if you want with your hands, just assist your, your breath on the way out. And that just makes you mindful of your breath and it helps to strengthen. And it actually pulls that oxygen down deeper into our lungs and it can actually strengthen the amount of oxygen that we have in our bodies. Okay, thank you for that. Next, we're gonna move to some shoulder rolls. So we started here with our mouth and our nose and we took that breath in, um, the breath of life. So now we're gonna start with some shoulder rolls. We're gonna just relax and we're gonna roll our shoulders forward gently two times. Gonna go three times. We're gonna go four times. Great, shake it off. Just get relaxed, open your legs a little bit, shoulder width. Now let's go backwards. One, two, three, four. Oh, great, shake it out. You should do that in a relaxed way. And it should, maybe at some point you can feel a tingling and that really relaxes your spine. So you can start with five times forward and five times backwards once a day or a couple of times a week. And then when you get ready and you feel good, you can just increase that to go to about 10. So you start forward and then you go backwards. You can start with about five initially each way and then you can increase that a little bit. And that really starts to relax our shoulders, it relaxes our, our neck muscles a little bit. And so and it starts to be, you, you become aware of your shoulders connected to your arms and your hands. Uh, the next thing I wanna do is I'm inspired by our, our previous um, presenter, Sue, and she talked about Tai Chi. And in Tai Chi, we do this one exercise and I want you to just get your hands here or you can put them to your side. And I want you to just squeeze them and let them go. 
squeeze them and let them go. And when you do that, you can just turn to the side. There's also, we can do this walking too. You just walk around and you're squeezing and you're letting go. But the other component is, is just smile. So you're smiling. So you're just, you're taking some nice deep breaths and you're squeezing your hands and then you're letting them go. Again, you can do that five times later on, or you can do it a couple of times a day. This is a wonderful practice to, to do every day. So when you get up to it and you feel like you're ready to go, you can just try this once a day. Again, these are just warm up exercises. All right, so we did deep breathing, we did our hands, we did shoulder rolls. Now the next thing I'm gonna do is we're still up here on top. <clears throat> we're gonna do some uh, diagonal, uh, actually some, some arm presses. So um, you're gonna take your left, and, and these exercises, you can start from your left or your right. I'm always confusing the two, so either way, as long as you do one side and then the other, it doesn't matter where you start. So you loosen up again, you get your arms, you get your left arm, or your right arm out, and then you just go across there and you just kind of reach over. And then you do the other side and you just reach over. You can do five of those. This will be two. This is two. If you'd like, you can also assist yourself and get a little bit deeper. And that's, that's only if you want to. You can assist your arm coming across and that gives you a little more stretch for those of you who can or who might need that. Again, this is four. This is four. And then the five. Great, great, fantastic. Now shake it off. Again, just start slowly, even if you start with two or three or maybe even five, you can just increase the repetitions or you can do once you start and you feel happy with it, you can do this once in the morning and then you can do it once in the afternoon and it, it really loosens up your upper body, okay? So the next one is gonna be real similar. This is gonna be, uh, so we went across that last time across. The next one is gonna be a little bit different, very similar but we're gonna take our arm and we're gonna go actually try to reach up a little bit. So you see this diagonal here, you're gonna reach up and then down. Again, you reach up, you're, you're going diagonally here, down. I've seen some of those younger kids and they're doing some dances, they're going like, like this, but this is actually relaxes us. If you want to assist yourself, you can. You're just kind of, this one is reaching up, the other one was more down. This is at an angle. Let's do a couple more. Last one. Okay, great. Shake it off and don't forget to breathe. These are perfect exercises to practice breathing through your nose. Another exercise that you can do to practice deep breathing is if you're washing dishes or you're going to put some trash outside or you're doing some chore, you can just be mindful of your breathing and just try breathing through your nose for a few minutes without breathing through our mouths. If we breathe through our nose, it prevents us from getting COVID, it's a little bit better for us as far as uh, not getting COVID. But one of the things, the main thing that it does is actually keeps water in our bodies. So we're actually meant to breathe through our nose. It, it can retain about 45% more uh, water in our bodies and if we, if we get less high, uh, dehydrated if we're doing more nose breathing throughout the day. So that's another reason that it's really helpful for us. Okay, the next thing we're gonna do is this is a rowing exercise. And so with both arms, you're just gonna put them straight out. And you can either put your hands together or you can keep them however you want. The main thing is, is this is, this is the rowing exercise. And so you're gonna get your arms out and then you're gonna pull them in. And as if you're rowing a boat, okay? 
So you're gonna have your arms out, you're gonna pull them in. As if you're gonna to try to pinch your, your, your hands back here. So that kind of like, uh, it actually releases a little stress from your shoulder blades. So you go out, you pull in. You're going out and you're pulling in. Now, all these exercises can be done standing and it, and it will be a little bit more uh, different if you stand, but it's perfectly fine to do them sitting, especially if you wanna do them at the edge of your bed or in a nice stable chair, make sure you're not doing it in a chair that has wheels in it. So put your hands out, in, and go ahead and go back a little bit as if you're pinching those, those arms or your shoulder blades together back there. So you go out, now we're going to do them with our deep breathing, okay? So we go out. When we're reaching, we're breathing in. Great. Again, you can do five of these or three of them or even two of them to start and then once you get the hang of it and you feel good about it and, it's, and your body's okay with it, you've checked to make sure that you're, you know, if you need to check with your physician, check to see if it's okay. And then you can increase the repetition and those repetitions are gonna help you increase your strength, okay? Okay, the next one we're gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna scoot back a little bit so you can see my feet. I think you can see my feet there. So, these ones are gonna be the, the foot circles. I hope you're all wearing your moccasins. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> so the foot circles, so keep your feet, your feet straight. You can do these a, a couple of different ways. You can either put your foot out like this and rest it on the floor. Or if you want, if you're a little bit stronger and you feel comfortable, you can raise them. So I'm gonna raise mine, but you're, you're okay. If you have it down like this on the ground, it's fine. You can do it that way too when you start. You can raise your foot and you're just gonna make circles. Circles, circles, circles. Four, five, down. Now we're gonna do the other side. You can keep it down like this and you can twist your ankles like this. One. Two, three, four, five. You bring it down. Now, if you went to the outside, change the direction of your foot. So I'm gonna go inside this time. One, two, three, four, five. You put your foot back down on the ground. And then other side. One, two, Three, four, five. Great. Just like all the other exercises, you can do these, a few of them, a couple of them to start your day off. If you want, you can increase that repetition. It's gonna help you. These are all fall prevention exercises. They will help you prevent falls. They're gonna give you more balance. And our ankles are really important. Our feet are really important when we're talking about falls. So. Make sure you have comfortable shoes. Make sure they're not too big. I highly discourage any flip-flops. We need to have sturdy shoes for inside the house and sturdy shoes for outside the house and make sure that they have a, a back to them. We don't encourage any flip-flops around the house or any slippers. They're really not um, as safe as we need for fall prevention. So consider that as one of the ideas I'm sharing with you today. The next thing we're gonna do how do y'all feel? Wow. Feeling good, Sistus. We probably need to uh, wrap up soon. I'm sorry. Okay. That's good. I'm, I'm done. There's other ones. If you would like, you can reach out to me at Aztec and Becky will give you my number if, and I can provide more exercise to you. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. <laughs> These two is such a blessing. I didn't even realize how tense my shoulders were. <laughs> Thank you very much. I really like the rowing one. <laughs> I need to be doing those. <laughs> um, 
Jennifer, do you know if we have Mr. Charlie with us? Can you confirm the 760 number? Oh. Uh, you know, I'm not sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, we're going to see. Let's see. Okay. I'm to unmute and ask Eddie to unmute. Becky? Yes, sir. This is Ben Charlie. Oh, hello, hello. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with the, Mr. Charlie, were you able to get to the doctor and back? Yes, they just gave me a, a steroid shot. Uh, I should have told him, but give me some Tai Chi stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we want to make sure uh, to, to do all the exercises Sisters just showed us. Um, Mr. Charlie, everybody is a is a NICOA board member and thanks to Mr. Curley, he kindly has agreed to talk to us a little bit because our next section of the of the celebration is about um, the new museum that's being uh, dedicated tomorrow, the National Museum of the American Indian Veterans Memorial. Um, Mr. Charlie is a board member and a treasurer for NICOA and he was um, in the Marines and he has agreed to talk with us a little bit about his experiences. And we have a picture of you, uh, Mr. Charlie, that you sent us yesterday with you, you and your buddy during your time in Vietnam. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, to all the Marines out there, uh, Semper Fi, uh, today is the Marine Corps' 245th birthday. The reason that um, my family, we're four generations. Um, my father was um, 20 years in the Marine Corps, got out as a gunnery sergeant. He was World War II in Korea. And then he was the start of uh, all of us be becoming Marines. Um, I've got three brothers who also were Marines and a little brother who's the Navy and a sister who's Air Force, that's eight of us kids. So that's pretty good. Seven out of eight children went into the military. We tried to send, have our sister go into the Marine Corps, but she thought she'd have to get tattoos to be a, a Marine, which wasn't true. And I have two sons um, that are Marines. One just retired from the Marine Corps. He put 20 years in and we're all, um, our MOS, um, we're all 311s which is infantry. And the reason that we stuck with the Marine Corps is that they have tradition and they have heritage similar to our people, what we have. So we encourage other tribal people to go into the military. It's our country. We have to fight for what, what is actually ours and stuff. And you can go, we, we push people to go to the Marine Corps because of what I said, there's, there's tradition and there's heritage, but all military branches will be good for our people. And it's good for our young people to, um, to go into the military because they, they learn two things. They learn discipline and they also have an opportunity to gain a scholarship you know, for, for college. And today, um, like I said, it's the Marine Corps birthday and stuff, but tomorrow is the big one where, where all veterans are, are going to be honored and stuff. And that's something that we didn't receive back in 68 and 69, that when we came back from Vietnam, that we, we weren't uh, given the, the respect that Afghanistan and all right people are, are getting today. But that's okay, you know, we're, as Indian people, we're, we're used to that from the public and it kind of makes us, I think, tougher. So uh, it just comes to being that being a veteran is a distinction that nobody can take from us as Indian people. And everybody's aware that all, all tribal people go into the military. It's, like I said, it's our country, and it's uh, it's uh, something that we'll never have to uh, be ashamed of. And it's something that we need to teach our younger people that the military is, is good for our people. 
and it's good for them and it's good for the family. That's all I need to say right now. I think all of your veterans who are listening, you probably can understand what I'm trying to say. And that um, let's hope that your children, your grandchildren um, will think about uh, going into the military, uh, specifically Marines. That's all I got, Becky. Thank you, Mr. Charlie. Uh, Larry, did you want to say anything? I still have to learn this technology, you know, <clears throat> muting and unmuting myself. But I really do think, thank you very much, Mr. Charlie, uh, for your your comments and and for your service. Thank you for your service. There are a lot of Native Americans uh, that are out there who have served in the military and all the different branches. My son uh, served in the, the Navy during the uh, the first um, Iraqi war. Um, so I'm, I'm very proud of him and I'm proud of all of the people who have served. And so, so I'm, I'm proud to have you on our board, Mr. Charlie. And uh, for those of you out there, you have relatives as well who have probably served in the military or serving in the military. And all I can say at this time uh, in our country Let's keep our prayers for them, that they be safe, and that they remain well. So um, those are just my comments, uh, Becky, and thank you for the opportunity. Of course. Um, Jennifer, did we want to uh, show that little video at this point, or should we? Oh, Mr. Tullis? Okay. Mr. Tullis, is, are you here, Mr. Tullis? Yes, uh, Mr. Tullis, if you can just unmute your phone. This, this is Andy Tullis, I'm here. Thanks for joining, Mr. Tullis. Um, as I was, I uh, subscribed to the magazine for the National Museum of the American Indian, and I was looking through it and I saw that your tribe was very uh, instrumental in do donating money and helping to, to take part in the creation of the memorial. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I'd be glad to. And first and foremost, I want to thank Rebecca and the staff for putting this program together and giving an awful lot of people to participate. And I'm honored to be uh, serving as the vice chairman of the board of directors of Nicola. And uh, so I'm happy to take part in this. Uh, as far as the memorial, as all of you know, for uh, an awful uh, effort was made to create the Museum of the American Indians in Washington, D.C. And it honors all American Indians. It's not just the veterans. And so a while, a number of years ago, a group of people made a decision that there ought to be something very, very special for the veterans, the American Indian veterans that had served this country. And so um, I've had the distinction of serving as uh, the tribal chairman of my tribe for a number of years. And I also had the honor of serving as the president of USET, which is the United South and Eastern Tribes. And both of those groups, both my tribe and USET, uh, got real interested in trying to join the effort to get the uh, to establish a memorial just for the American Indian veterans. Uh, a good friend of mine who passed away last year, a Seminole veteran by the name of Stephen Bowers, uh, led the effort from the USET organization. And so a number of the tribes in USET got involved and felt that there definitely would, had to be something on the, at the museum to honor the American Indian veterans. Uh, I, I'm awful proud of my tribe. My tribe has been very active in not only 
in national affairs to honor the American Indian veterans, but we have a real active local program. Uh, our local newspaper, our tribal newspaper, shares an article about some veterans every single month. And so we try to do it regularly so those people will realize it's just not the other people that's getting honored, but some of our local Forge Creek uh, tribal members get honored too. But my tribe has been blessed with uh, very successful casino operations. And when we realized that there was a need for the tribes to step forward when it came to fundraising time for the, the memorial for the American Indians, uh, my tribe joined a number of other tribes here in the East and stepped forward. My tribe in particular donated a million dollars to start the fundraising, and we challenged some other tribes to match our donation, and so it contributed greatly to the effort of the staff at the museum to raise the money to create the memorial. And so um, personally and both uh, as a member of the Fort Creek Indians, I'm proud of what my tribe done. I'm proud of the people who kept the faith and uh, worked diligently to raise enough money to get the museum to move forward with the program of establishing the memorial. And it's there now for people to see, and it'll be something that all of us can be proud of. Uh, certainly, I don't think that there's anyone that uh, served in our armed forces that don't deserve to be uh, recognized especially for what they've done, not just the fact that they were the American Indians, but also the fact that they did volunteer to serve their country. And so it's my pleasure to participate today. I hope that everyone there will take the opportunity to visit the museum, uh, partake of that. And I, uh, again, appreciate what my tribe done but I greatly appreciate what other tribes have done, and I appreciate the staff at the museum who has uh, taken on a long-term goal, and they've seen it to conclusion, and that's something we all should be proud of. And I thank you for allowing me to be a participant in this program today. We are so grateful. Um First of all, for your help as a as a longtime board member for NICOA, we couldn't manage without you, Mr. Tullis, and um, for the work you've done to help see through that project to completion. Um, just put in the chat the link for the web page for the Smithsonian, uh, and you can see there's going to be a live, uh, when they dedicate the, the memorial tomorrow, there'll be a live stream of that, and there's going to be a, a beautiful exhibition as well. So please go to that website tomorrow on Veterans Day and uh, I'm sure you'll, you'll find it very interesting. Um, now, Jennifer, I believe the next thing we're going to do is a slideshow. Oh, video, excuse me. He called my Ikenna Hale. Welcome to this sacred place. I remember everything happening so quickly. I left for boot camp. I was in training. Uncle Sam thought I was having too much fun on the beach, and so I was drafted in 1966. I volunteered to go into combat. Within a month, I was on my way to Vietnam. I was shown to my barracks. And I looked around the room and I thought, this is it. This is my life now. We have a long history of Native veterans, uh, more per capita than any other race. My brother was in the Air Force. Four generations in the United States Marine Corps. And my son was in the Navy after me. My grandfather was a Coast Guard officer. I am the first veteran in my family. I think it's really important to challenge the stereotype of what a Native veteran is. It was either serve or be a drug dealer. Wanted to 
go to college but didn't have the money. Not everyone had that choice. Sometimes it feels really romanticized when the costs of war are really high. I always thought that I could transfer some of my luck to my sons. The day my son was killed, he was carrying this flag in combat. That was hard to accept. We are the First Nation, and we will defend our land, no matter what. I feel like I'm just doing what's right or what needs to be done, or maybe what I feel I'm called to do. The skills of being a good soldier is something you learn, but to be a good warrior, it's something deeper than that. It's about your inner spirit, what things are important to you to the point that you will fight for them. It's something that I feel pumping through my veins and it's what I breathe and live every day. Everyone who signed up for this event um, was asked to name a veteran that they would like to honor. And I will make my best effort to say the names and please forgive me if I mispronounce. Adam Thomas, Muscogee Creek Nation Army. Anthony Begay, Navajo Marine. Benjamin Charlie Jr. Dunlap Band of Mono Indians honorably discharged from U.S. Marine Corps. Charles Foster, United Katua Band of Cherokee Indians in Oklahoma, Army. Cheyenne Dog Soldiers, Vance Tamakara Comanche Navy, Garrison Tamakara Comanche Air Force, adopted son Wayne Phillips Comanche Navy Submariner, Monroe Takamakara Comanche Marine, Marvin Takamakara Comanche Army. Earl Wright, Minnesota Chippewa Tribe Army. Franklin Silas, Athabascan Army. George R. Holstein, Red Lake Chippewa U.S. Air Force. Gilbert M. Anton, Toda Orum. Glendon Wayne Bullock, Alabama Crescuta Army. Henry David Nena, Tule River, Yalumi, retired U.S. Army. Henry Illick, Quapaw Nation Army. John Bear, Muscogee Creek, U.S. Marines. John Davis, Army. John F. Johnson, Tata Autumn, Army. Johnson Lee Owl, Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, Army. Larry Blackfox Bowman, Shawnee, United States Army. Larry H. Montoya, Navajo Army. Lawrence A. Begay, Navajo, U.S. Air Force, Korean War. Major Manuel Hernandez, Barona Band of Mission Indians, U.S. Army. Manuel Garcia, Prairie Band, Potawatomi Army. Marshall Presley, Porch Creek Army. Benny Presley, Porch Creek Army. Michael May, Chickasaw Army. Miss Connie Ponco, Acoma Pueblo Army. Navajo Code Talker Marines. Dad was in Air Force. Pershing Yako, Kiowa Tribe Military Branch Marines. Peter Garcia, Kowitakan Army. Peter Ruiz, Toto Autumn Nation Air Force. Post number 38 of Ponca Tribe of Oklahoma. Reynolds Thomas, Fallon Paiute Shoshone Tribe Army. Richard Shaw Jr., Minnesota Chippewa Lake Superior Band, FDL Army. Roger Henry Santee Sioux Army. Staff Sergeant Wilbur Sapcut, Comanche Nation, United States Air Force. Stephen Williams, White Earth Nation, U.S. Navy. Suquamish, Vietnam War Veterans. Vincent Martinson, LCO Army. 
Willard E. LeCount, Turtle Mountain Chippewa, Army, Anti-Aircraft, World War II. William Maney, Army. Lawrence Cotter, Army. Grant Lewis, Air Force. Charles Raymond, Army Marines. Robert Smith, Marines. Jack Lincoln, Army, deceased. Alabama Cushada Tribal Veterans. Alex Ginot, Turtle Mountain Chippewa, U.S. Marines. All Hickra Apache Brothers, World War II. Lacey V. Hill, Navy. Charlie V. Hill, Navy. Thomas V. Hill, Army. Philip V. Hill, Army. Alan C. Mujet, Anthony Lamare. Christian McCabe, Navajo, Seneca, Dakota, Army Special Forces, Green Beret. Daryl Grigg, Tribal Affiliation Unknown, U.S. Marine Corps, Native Mother Deceased. My father, a World War II veteran, 98, Luther Davis. Don Head, Gwich'in First Nation Army. Frank Blevins, Cherokee. Gregory Zephyr, Sr., Yankton Sioux Air Force. Honor to all who have served. Kurt Keller, Mill Lax Band of Ojibwe Army. Leela Plaster Johnston, Lumi Nation Army. Martin Allen Jim, Prairie Band Potawatomi, U.S. Army. Mead Chickabitty, Comanche Army. John B. McClung, Comanche Army. John G. McClung, Comanche Army. Myron Potts, Prairie Band Potawatomi, U.S. Navy and Army. Paul Bonnell, Abenaki Army. Richard M. Staples, St. Croix Tribe, Army. Richard Sabori, Gila River, Indian Community Marines. John Griffith Kisto, Gila River, Indian Community Marines. Sac and Fox Nation Veterans, Sac and Fox All. Savannah Meyer, Cowlitz Navy. Tahinos, the Navajo Code Talkers. Tony Burris, Choctaw, United States Army. Troy Hicks, Fallon Paiute Shoshone Tribe Air Force, Winnebago Tribe of Nebraska, Hilliard Payer Army. And let me please um, go back and read in the chat. My father, Liggett A. Bryant Jr. My dad, Wayne J. Tonskett, served in the Navy. My brother, Robert Williams, Yakima Nation, U.S. Army. My brother, Harrison L. Ballard, Hickoria Apache Army. Thanks to all those past and present who have served this great country. My cousin Ronald Avlak Cowlitz Tribe Army. Martin Stacy Ho-Chunk Nation Army. Joseph Stacy Ho-Chunk Nation Army. Darwin DeCamp Comanche Army. And Kathy DeCamp Ho-Chunk Nation Army. Jeffrey L. Hale. Hale 82nd Airborne Army. Thank you for all your precious service to all Native Americans. Thank you for your service to all Native veterans. Edwin Wilson Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe Army. Master Sergeant Jimmy K. Lewin Sr. Taos Pueblo Army Air Force. Willis William Hosilakwasi Bad Hand Rosebud Sioux U.S. Air Force. Wayne Metoxen, Oneida Tribe Air Force, Lillian L. Lujan Navajo, Women's Army Corps. Okay, I think, thank you. Thank you everyone. And now I want to um, ask Larry Curley to please come back and, and wrap up for us. Um, Rebecca, Becky? I'm so sorry. <clears throat> I, I, I'm so sorry. <laughs> and Lavender Hill Oneida Army was one more. I'm sorry, Lisa. <laughs> now sorry. we have two more raffle uh, tickets or uh, gift cards. I'm sorry. Okay, this is the last um, gift card giveaway. Um, must be present to win. Um, the two names I'm calling is Dorothy Waite and um, Mary Jo Hunter. 
And then in the chat box, just um, say that you're here. And next um, is Larry Curley to wrap up in a closing prayer. Thank you all very much. When it's very interesting to hear and listen to all that has been presented today. And one of the things that I remember when I was younger, I started in the field of aging when I was 24 years old. And I thought getting old was a long, long ways off. And for those of you who are younger than I am, it comes really quick. It comes real quick. One day you're young, next day you're looking in the mirror and you're going, who is that old guy looking at me in the mirror? So for me, it's been a learning experience over 40 some years of experience listening to our elders, learning from them. And one of the things we talked about once was with my father. I asked him one time, I said, hey, dad, are we poor? And his comment to me was, you will be poor. You're only going to be poor if you don't have any kins, no relatives. That's when you're really poor. And that's part of the wealth that we have. And we have spirituality. We still have our prayers. We still have our ceremonies. And we have our humor. We laugh at a lot of things, even when things are really at its worst we laugh at things, we learn how to laugh because it keeps us balanced and it keeps us strong. We know that. And we also know how to sacrifice. A lot of my friends that I grew up with are gone. Some of them served in Vietnam, some in Afghanistan. We know sacrifice and in all of that, it's our elders that have gone and done many things. We talked about self-determination and learning how to control our resources and our assets. It was our elders that brought us to this point. And I'm very thankful for that. And lastly, I wanna thank AARP, Kaufman Associates for helping us in putting this whole uh, event together, a celebration of our elders. And with that, as in any Indian meeting, you close with a prayer. And I will do that again in my native Navajo language. Yat eo e ya con sete ke so le. Mikina nishita out ehegi, ike masan ike che, e pa atet. Aro con de con, da he se nils agi. Es ka nature ho nas na de ni kato le, kut a e ya. Arts is a go kodotso is an e inanish lad o le. Hajon hustling, hajon hustling, hajon hustling, hajon hustling. Thank you.